So, welcome again, everyone. Good evening. Um, this particular program tonight could be subtitled An Exploration of the Pivotal Japanese Tendai Ancestor Jikaku Daishi Enin and his success due to lay Buddhism in China. But that's far too long and not sufficiently descriptive. So, next slide, please. So, instead, I chose to call it. I'm trying to remember why I called it. I didn't write it down. Um, <laughs> Living the Dharma During Persecution. And this came, the title came out of some things we can, we'll talk about later. But this evening, um, next please. Uh, yes, next please. This evening, oh, one second, I can do it. What am I asking you? Mm -hmm. Okay. I got to turn on. I forgot that we have a remote here. This evening, I'd like to share a story. This is about a fascinating person who would eventually become the third Zasu, head priest of Tendai Buddhism in Japan. His name was Enin. Originally, his, his original his uh, name at birth was Mibu. And though he is best known as Jikaku Daishi, his posthumous name, and for people who aren't aware of that in Japan, when you hear the term Saicho, Saicho is referring to um, uh, the person who founded Tendai Buddhism in Japan. His posthumous name is uh, uh, Dengyo, Dengyo Daishi. Daishi is part of the name that is given posthumously. And when I say given, it's not a name that's taken posthumously, it's given by the emperor. So in this case, Inen, after he had become Zasu and after he had died, he was then given the name uh, Jigaku Daishi by the Emperor of Japan. Um, Inen was instrumental in expanding Tendai school's influence in Japan and returning from China with critical training and resources, especially esoteric Buddhist practices and pure land teachings. He's perhaps equally well known as a monk, as a monk who lived in China for a little over nine years, keeping a diary that provides the world with the most respected account of the Chinese late Tang dynasty during a period of Buddhist persecution. More about that later. The best known translator of that book is the esteemed Asian studies scholar, Edwin Rushauer, whose book written in 1955, I had originally read many years ago. And then in 1993, Reverend Saito Enshin, a very good friend and scholar, and not incidentally an adventurous pilgrim himself, was kind enough to provide me with a copy of his newly published book, The Biography of Jikaku Daishi Enin. And I had read the book with great interest. And I had thought about it for a long time that I'd like to do a presentation on Jikaku Daishi and these two well-researched uh, translations. Upon taking and, and so I, 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 I picked up um, Saito Sensei's book and I pull it out of its slipcover and out pops this paper, um, which you can see right here. And I had vaguely looked at this many years earlier when I, back in, in the 90s, when I first read uh, Saito Sensei's um, version book on, on Jigaku Daishi, and all of a sudden it hit me. Um, it's an account of how Enin was assisted by lay Buddhists during the Tang persecution. While that would have been interesting enough, it also provides us with a perspective on the role of laity in Buddhism in a way that we don't, don't often see. A perspective would serve us well today to better understand the depth of Buddhist lay devotion. And this presentation is coming from this short paper primarily, as well as other books, because when I fell down the rabbit hole on the Tang Dynasty and the Sui Dynasty and the Song Dynasty, well, you can imagine. So I'm going to try to put this material into context using these materials. To best understand the period in which Dai Jikaku Daishi was in Tang, China. At that time, he was Enin. So he was Enin. So scholars will refer to him as Enin 
until they're referring to him a little bit later in relation to his uh, contributions to Japanese Tendai, then they usually say Jikaku Daishi. So he's known by both names. Um, so to put it in the context of the Tang Dynasty, it's useful to put this and start looking at the two dynasties that were on either side, the Sui Dynasty. Now I'm shortening this a little bit, otherwise we're never going to get out of here tonight. Um, the Sui Dynasty was a period that unified China. When we think of China, we picture China today, which is an enormous country, broken into various places that we mostly know through Chinese restaurants, <laughs> you know, like Hunan and um, Sichuan. Sichuan and Canton, et cetera, et cetera. Well, those are regions of, of China. And the this was a period in which China had been uh, unified the Sui dynasty, that is, after four centuries of fragmentation in which both North and South China were in a state of disarray. And the unification of China uh, under the Sui and Tang dynasties was the catalyst for the formation of most common East Asian culture that we think of today. So when we think of Buddhism in China, to, uh, when we think of Buddhism in East Asia today, it was really taking place uh, during these dynasties. If you look at the dynasty dates on there, 581 to 818, you'll see that the Sui dynasty actually was, uh, that should be 618, sorry, I just didn't look at it probably. You'll see that that's the period of time in which Buddhism was introduced into Japan. You'll see that um, when we go on to the uh, Song Dynasty 960 to 1279. That's just after the, the Tang Dynasty. So like I said, I'm, I'm skipping through a bunch of stuff here so that I can cover everything. Um, and the area of the Tang Dynasty, this dynasty ruled the country during one of the most brilliant cultural epochs, and it's commonly divided into the Northern and Southern Song periods as its dynasty, dynasty ruled only in South China after 1127. And it's during these three periods of time, the Sui, the Tang, and the Song, that we see Buddhism developing organically in China that greatly influenced Japanese Buddhism. And though the Tibetans would disagree with this, it also had an intense effect on Tibetan uh, Buddhism because Buddhism in Tibet had been introduced, but then had, had been basically forced out of Tibet. And it was only during this period of time, during specifically the Tang Dynasty, that you have uh, Tsongkhapa, Padmasvaha, etc., coming back and re-in reintroducing, if you will, and reinvigorating Buddhism in Tibet. Perhaps uh, Itjishima Sensei would like to say something about that later. That's that he's a scholar on that specifically. Um, so. <clears throat> Moving along, the Tang Dynasty um, developed a successful form of government and administration based on the Sui Dynasty model. And it stimulated a culture of artistic, artistic flowering. And the Tang Dynasty, like most, rolled in ruled in duplicity and murder, and it, and it subsidized, as, um, excuse me, became a kind of anarchy at its very end. So the early part of the Dang was, Tang was very uh, fruitful, but then near the end of that dynasty, it, it had some difficulties. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I'll highlight two figures that are important to our story. One is Empress Wu, de facto ruler of the dynasty from 665 to 705, considered one of the greatest emperor, empress, emperors in Chinese history, do, I should say empress, in Chinese history due to her strong leadership and effective government governance and made China one of the world's most powerful nations even at that time. This was at the time that the Silk Road was, was being developed and, and going through there. The importance to history of her tenure includes the major expansion of the Chinese empire extended far beyond its previous territorial limits. And you can see here that in, in this particular photo that the green 
um, is the Sui dynasty. And you'll see the outline of the red going all the way out into the west across the desert. That becomes the Tang. And then you see um, a, the Song dynasty is somewhat reduced um, at, a later, at a later period of time. Also, I'd like to point out, you know, everyone knows about the Great Wall of China. And which, by the way, you cannot see from outer space. That, I don't know who made that up, but you can't see. I, I can't say that I know that from personal experience, but I've been told. But the thing that one of the things that made China really dynamic was to develop the canal system. And it's it's really amazing to me how we don't really read very we read about the Great Wall, but we never read about the canal system, which is what gave these, these uh, rulers an incredible amount of power, because it meant in the same way that the Erie Canal going from Albany to Buffalo really opened up the United States to the West. Well, the canal system in China uh, did the same thing, <clears throat> literally opening it up to the West. Um, her successor, Emperor Xuanzang is renowned for the cultural heights reached during his rule from 712 to 756, which would be during the Nara period in Japan. He welcomed Buddhists and Taoist clerics to his court, including teachers of Tantric Buddhism, a recent form of religion. And just so people know, and this is where uh, we see how China became important to Tibet, Tantric Buddhism was introduced in China in 725. And so it had been developed at um, Nalanda in eastern India, a, a university, monastic university complex in eastern India. And this, that's when it really reached its fluorescence. And the, the, that, that's worthy of a, of a story all in and of itself. But the monasteries became important aspects in many areas of life, including schools for children, lodging for travelers, and spaces for gathering and parties. Monasteries were large landowners. At, during the Tang Dynasty, it's estimated that monasteries and temples owned 40% of the land mass of China. Think about that. Also think about the fact that that's one of the things that led to the persecution. <laughs> if you're the emperor having tax exempt po property, 40% of the land mass is not something that you're going to encourage and you're going to discourage. Well, how do you discourage it? You'll find out in a few moments. Um, the Buddhist monks were proactive in spreading Buddhist stories into the Chinese popular culture, which led to Buddhist festivals were embraced by all the people. And the backlash that grew really started in 841 uh, with the crackdown on Buddhism as well as other religions. Buddhism wasn't the only one that was, that was spared. Nearly 50,000 monasteries and chapels were destroyed, 150,000 slaves seized, 260,000 monks and nuns forced back into civilian life. And the orders were, were abolished in 845. Think, think about that. 260,000 monks and nuns. That was their way of life. You know, and, and I don't know what percentage of the population that was in China at the time. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm guessing, this is just an educated guess, and I'm guessing that the population in China at that time may have been around 3 million people. So that was a substantial number of, of people. The period we're discussing this evening is the latter part of that dynasty. But before we do that, let's talk about Chikaku Daishi a little bit. I mean, so he was born in Tochigi, what is today Tochigi Prefecture, entered the Buddhist priesthood at Enrakuji at 14, was a Deshi of Saicho, the founder of Tendai Buddhism. Um, and he, best known for his diary, and following the pilgrimage to China life, like I said before, he became the third Zasu. And he was given the name, um, 
specifically, oh, and by the way, for those who have been to Japan, um, Tochigi Prefecture is where Nikko is located, which is why I have the famous bridge of Nikko behind in the back of that in that picture. Um, Ennian's writings were considered extremely valued as historical sources. His book was the first written about China and its life by a foreigner. Oh, stop and think about that. He did not write an evaluation of what he saw, but rather wrote about religious matters and Chinese life under the Tang Dynasty. And because, as we'll find out later, all these temples and monasteries were destroyed, his recount became sort of the de facto official history of China during the Tang Dynasty, because all those materials were lost due to, due to the, the temples and monasteries being burned down. Um, and his, his diary is a good source of the practice of popular Buddhism in China. He describes ceremonies as well. He brought back many sutras and mandalas to Japan, but he struggled during his persecution. And as I say, in 854, he became the chief abbot of Tendai Zasu Enrakuji Monastery, a position that he held for 20 years. And he was the founder of the Senwon branch of Tendai. And just for people who are not aware, there's two main branches of, of Tendai. One is housed in Enrakuji at the summit of the mountain. And the other is today called Miyadera. At the time, it was called Enjoji, uh, the temple that's at the base of the mountain. And that's the Jimon lineage. So those are the two lineages within major uh, branches, not lineages, but major branches within within Tendai. And so I won't get into, which is one of the things you could, talking about um, Dengyo Daishi. I won't get into the struggle between um, Dengyo Daishi and Enjin, who became the founder of the um, branch at the base of, of Mount Hiei. It was Enin who introduced Japanese Buddhism to Nembutsu, chanting the name of Amida Buddha, and this contributed to a new sense of religious observance developing in the rural areas of Japan. He also brought Shomyo, a system of music notation from China still used in Japan, which now has spread to this temple since we teach Shomyo to all of our, the priests who train here. Let's look a little bit more closely at Enin's pilgrimage and how it relates to the role of the Chinese laity in Enin's struggle during the persecution. <clears throat> in, let's see. in 835, Enin petitioned the court of Japan to visit China. He left Japan in 838 with the last official Japanese embassy to the Tang court, and accompanying were two Tendai monks, Engyo and Jokyo, Jokoyo, I should say. Um, the, Engyo is also sometimes known as Yuigyo. Um, unable to gain permission to visit Mount Tiantai, which is what he intended to do, the headquarters of Chinese Tiantai school, he studied Sanskrit and received Kanjo Abhisheka, or consecrated anointment, mm -hmm. into the Vajradhatu Mandala and the Garbhakosatu Mandala and other esoteric Mikyo doctrines and practices by the monk Kuan Ya. When the weather kept him from returning to Japan, he eventually made his way to Mount Wutai in northern China, a center of pure land practices. And Wutai Shan is considered also a sacred mountain, as is Tiantai. Here, Enin studied Tiantai texts and Mikyo and participated in Pure Land practices. And in 840, he went to the capital, Chang'an, where for six years he deepened his knowledge and added expertise, specifically in the Susidi Sutra, based on the Perfect Achievement Sutra, an esoteric tradition unknown in Japan up until that time. When he returned home in 847, he brought with him eight, 559 volumes of Chinese Buddhist literature and many religious implements for Buddhist rituals. The last period of his pilgrimage is of special interest to us today. And this occurred during the Huichang persecution of Buddhism. 
Ennian had the bad luck of living in the capital during the first, fourth and worst persecution of Buddhism in Chinese history. There had been other persecutions of Buddhism previous to this. Um, and, and just, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. He attempted to return to Japan, but was unable, as I said. He, so he removed his robes during this period of time so that he would not be singled out. And you've heard me say when I've given uh, refuge, when you see the Wagesa, the Wagesa becomes that we give out during uh, a Hages, as we give out to anyone during a refuge, but priests wear the Wagesa, which is a complete circle. And that was a piece of cloth so that during this period of time, monks would put it in their sleeve so that when they were just walking down the road or doing whatever they were doing, the military, the soldiers who would come along would not mistake them for monks and kill them. <laughs> and so they would, in order to maintain uh, their, um, their order, they would wear a wagesa when they were saying their prayers, meditating, doing other, other religious uh, observances. And he himself, meaning uh, any, wore a cap to cover his bald head, since the people who purposely shaved their heads were identified as monks. The reaching persecution of Buddhism was initiated by the Emperor Wuzong of the Tang Dynasty during the era 841 to 845. Among its purposes was to appropriate war funds and to clean Tang China of foreign influences. You've got to watch out for immigrants along the southern border. That was that was the that was the message at that time. Although in his case it was immigrants from the northern border, but we'll ignore that for the moment. Um, so its purpose was to get funds for the many wars that it fought, as you can see by the fact that it expanded to the west. Well, how does it do that? Which I implied before, <clears throat> you basically turn all the monks and nuns into lay folks. Now they have to pay taxes. It's interesting how the Chinese um, taxation system was not too different than the taxation system today. We have a 501c3. We've got to be really careful, don't we? You know, you never know what's going to happen with the wrong rulers. Um, so the persecution was not only directed toward Buddhists, but it was also directed toward Zoroastrians, Jews, Nestorians, Christians, Manichaeism, and it was a, across the board against anything that was foreign. What was it not against? Confucianism and Taoism, since they were the indigenous religions. How, how many Christians were, were there? Uh, they, they were Nestorian Christians, and, and the number I couldn't begin to tell oh. you. There was a particular branch of Christianity. Um, do you know anything about the Nestorians? Well, they were a heterodox sect uh, that was early in, I guess, patristic, late patristic history, mm -hmm. the second, third century on. But they were in the Chinese court. Were they well known because they wore nests on their heads? No, I'm just kidding. That's for the bishop and Nestorius. Right. <laughs> so there were, going through this quickly, there were two phases, there are two phases of the persecution that began in 842. And at first it was more of a reform. They wanted to, uh, the monks and nuns, to turn over the wealth to the government. And if they um, wished to keep their wealth, they could be returned to lay life and forced to pay taxes. Gradually, however, uh, Wu Zong was influenced by the claims of some Taoists and came to develop a severe dislike for Buddhists. Inan even suggested that the emperor had been influenced by his illicit love of a beautiful Taoist princess. By the way, uh, the emperor became emperor when he was 16. So he had a lot of hormone stuff going on <laughs> at this time. Um, and I want to make a point here that while Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism uh, intersected on philosophy and practices, and so much of what we think of as Buddhist may have come from Taoism and Confucianism, much of what we think of as Taoism came from Buddhism, 
etc. They were still powerful forces in the court, and they gained their power through patronage by the court. And so on one hand, philosophically, they intersected. On the other hand, they were vying for support from the court. And that had gone back, you know, many, many years back to uh, 200, 300 uh, CE in China. So as time went on, the emperor became less well measured in his judgment. And one of his edicts banned the use of a single wheel wheelbarrows as they break up the middle of the road, an important concept of Taoism. He was one of those rulers who would just say whatever came to his mind at the moment. I, I think we have some examples of that today. In 844, the persecution moved into the second phase aimed at eradicating Buddhism. And that's when the monasteries, the temples, the monks, the nuns, etc., really, really felt it. Um, by edict in 845, all the monasteries were abolished with very few exceptions with all the images of bronze, silver, and gold handed over to the government. In 846, reportedly, the emperor died, I should say reportedly, by Taoist elixirs. Remember, many people know Taoism from Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching. Maybe they know a little bit from Mo Tzu uh, or Chuang Tzu. However, Taoists also practiced alchemy. And when they talked about producing everlasting life, meaning physical well-being, living forever, they weren't kidding. That was their lead into gold trick of alchemy. And so they had all these potions that they would give you, from which I have to say much of acupuncture grew. That's right. out of. <laughs> they had all of these potions that grew, and many of them were very poisonous in the same way that you know, we were still giving people mercury in the 19th century <laughs> in medicine in the, in the in, in Europe. Yeah. So uh, shortly after his death, and although some report that it was due to the elixirs he took to, to, for a long life, others report that he was intentionally poisoned. Both can be true. Mm -hmm. um, shortly after his death, his successor proclaimed a general amnesty ending the persecution. And then, just to go forward a little bit into the Song Dynasty, Song Dynasty was a period of great um, fluorescence of Buddhism in China. During the, the Tang Dynasty, the Hua Yen school basically died out. And some of the Chan schools died out at the same time. But during the Song Dynasty, other schools of Buddhism went on the rise, including some of the schools of Chan. And, and also um, uh, Tiantai. So when was An in, in China? He was in China from, well, yeah, he was in China from, I'll give you the exact dates, um, 838 to 847. So, so during the persecution? During the persecution. Okay. That's why I was telling you about the persecution. Right. Uh, and so I wanted to set the stage for the real topic, which concerns Enning's relationship with lay Buddhists in China. And to quote Saito Sensei, Enning had been supported by various lay Buddhists. Their dramatic support of Enning at the risk of their livelihood, even their lives, was especially crucial when it was he was banished from Chang'an. Chang Enning could, have, could not have perfected his pilgrimage and study without their earnest support because of the persecution of Buddhism by the Emperor Wutsung. And I'm going to provide a couple of uh, examples given by Saito Sensei. <clears throat> As Saito Sensei tells it, and he was considered a kind of poor Japanese priest during this persecution, even worried about raising funds for a mandala in his dream. And arrangements for the mandala were finally completed in 841. In 843, he wrote to the Tzu Cheng Tzu, where he and his disciples resided on the death of his disciple, Engyo. That said, disciple, this is a quote from Saito Sensei. That said, disciple Jojo, Jokyo has died, and excuse me, Engyo 
has died and I have no money at all but to buy a grave plot. I humbly beg that the monastery officers and the benevolence grant me a grave plot in which to inter him respectfully. As stated above, I humbly request this decision. He collected hundreds of volumes of sutra texts and scroll, scrolls, and he didn't have sufficient funds to transport them to Japan when he was trying to go back to Japan. He hired a donkey at every station to carry those Buddhist scriptures and teachings in secret. He had letters of support from the administrative officers, and he subsequently met the chief administrative officer. In Saito's words, they treated him kindly, took them under their wings, gave him funds for travel, and prepared a boat for him to sail down the canal. And as I said before, it's not only lay people, but in many cases, the lay people that were assisting him were very influential administrators in China. Um, and for people who don't know, there was a meritocracy, quote unquote, meritocracy in China. The young, primarily aristocrats, took exams to become administrators, <laughs> uh, and many of these were, in fact, uh, Buddhists. So, wow, time's flying. Um, let me start with the case of Xin Hu Hu, uh, and I'm going to read from Saito Sensei's paper. Um, and as Saito Sensei says, I think this farewell re speech reflects his sincere respect for any speaking about the uh, uh, Heat Sen Wen Yu. Any also had a close friend, Sin Wen Yu, the chief administrator of the, and of the perf prefect of Chin Shu and censor of the palace of external affairs. They met in Chu Shou on this occasion. And Yin, and Yin said, Hu Tsen, while at Chang'an, had long provided me with the funds for food, has been most kind in his attitude toward me. Last year, he became chief administrator of Cheng Chu and had come to this post. Now we met at the prefect, prefectural government with sorrow and joy were mixed together. He inquired most solicitously about us and invited us to his house where he took our midday pause and rest. And uh, he goes on to say, finally, they took a le fearful leave in Chengchou. Tzu Tsin Wen Yu, as well as Li Wan So, were earnest Buddhists and sincere supporters of Anin in Chang'an. Now, it seemed, met Anin again in his place of appointment and kindly inquired after him on parting that Tsin gave Anin traveling expenses and silk. However, he could not separate easily from Anin, so he made Anin on a so he met Anin on a horse as fast as he could and had a dramatic dialogue. Anin searched for the Buddhist teachings in Chang under the support of these lay Buddhists, and when the persecution of Buddhism began, Anin was helped and protected by his people, who could have ended up sacrificing all their interests. And I'm going to do one more really quick. And this is sort of long, so I'm going to, because it's getting late, so I'm going to cut this off a bit. Um, Yang Chang sent a man a letter saying, I, your disciple, have written five documents and notes in my own hand for the officials. I have known of old in the prefectures and subprefectures on your route. If you take these letters, they should help you get through. Skipping ahead, they had given, they had been supporting Enian and Chang. When Enian left there, they helped him to pack and gave him funds for travel and various kinds of goods. In addition, they gave him letters of requests for supporting Enian to their friends residing on Enian's route. Yang Ching Chi secretly took Chi Tsuan, who once was banished from Chang under his wings. Chi Tsuan was a court priest. At that time, when Yu Gyo, a disciple of the name died in Chang'an, and Yin had no money at all to buy a great plot. Upon Yin's humble request, Chi Xuan prepared a grave. He kindly sent his fellow priest to accompany the funeral procession of Yu Gyo. As I said earlier, these people risked their positions in Chinese society to aid Chi Yi, to aid Yin. 
Let me just skip forward a little bit further. And I'm going to offer a few reflections since we don't have much time. <laughs> reflections. Rather than offering conclusions, I'd like to offer some reflections about Anin Shikaku Daishi, the lay Buddhists who provided him support, protection, and assistance and what the Yang late Tang Dynasty may have to teach us today. We have all heard the saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. It's attributed to American philosopher, who was really Spanish, George Santayana. Unfortunately, I'm not convinced that just remembering history helps. We must learn its lessons in a way that cause us to change the patterns of our behavior. There are learned people today who have learned the lessons of history well enough but whose greed, anger, and delusion blind them to what must be done not to repeat those mistakes again. In this presentation, I've tried to present the case of brave, generous people who, through Buddhist teachings, were able to make a difference to the world they lived in at that time. We're con confronted with many difficulties today. The question I have is, can we be as courageous and devoted to make a difference in our world? Thank you. And now, and by the way, I couldn't resist. In China, this little critter was thought to be extinct, extinct. And then in the 1930s, they found a couple of them. And they lost them again. And then just within the last 12 or so years, they found a colony of them. They're called, <laughs> they sort of look at two. They're called magic rabbits in China. I thought. How can how can you have how can you have this discussion and not discuss magic rabbits? <laughs> so, what questions and comments do we have? We'll wait for a moment. And but first, I'd like to ask Ichishima Sensei if you have any remarks you would like to make. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, introducing Engine's uh, diary and. Uh, his activities in China. And I, was, I think uh, today's our liturgies of Tendai Buddhism, really he made, uh, made a foundation of that uh, chanting, uh, such, uh, you know, Namu Amida Butsu, et cetera, or Shomyo, or such kind of things. I, I, think, I think he made a basis for today's uh, tradition. And uh, um, yes, uh, during his uh, stay in China, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, Huichan's persecution happened, and uh, but so uh, many historical things disappeared from China, and but uh, Enning made a diary very uh, consistently and. Uh, very famous uh, Edwin O. Reicher, uh, ambassador to Japan. He's, uh, uh, he, uh, he wrote uh, uh, Enin's diary in English. That is, I think, uh, very uh, important to understand Chinese culture at that time, I think. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ichishima Sensei. I appreciate your comments.